I don't know if you've ever used the phrase. I'm su- su- sure you've heard the phrase. It doesn't hold a candle to. You know that phrase? Well, that phrase comes from our history when there, there was no el- electricity and a master workman would be working on a project and it would get dark and so he would have his apprentice hold a candle uh, to his work so that he could see the work being done and the apprentice, because he was near holding the candle, could actually observe how to do the work and so the apprentice would be holding a candle to the master workman and if you were not even of the status to be an apprentice, then you couldn't hold the candle to the master and so it was really low status. In Numbers chapter 12, Moses is the leader of the Israelites and his brother and sister, Aaron and Miriam, they're not really excited about some of the things that Moses is doing. They, they really have the opinion that uh, he, he's not really better than we are. Why can't we just lead and why does he get all the credit? And They're not really happy about Moses leading the way he's leading so they kind of grumble against him. And that's not a real good decision because Moses is God's chosen leader. It is Moses that uh, God has conversations with. The the Bible describes it as a friend speaks to a friend face to face. So Moses and the Lord spoke to each other. Moses is the one of Scripture who says that uh, Moses, the servant of the Lord, faithful in my house. God, God told Aaron and Miriam, you should have been afraid to speak against my servant, Moses. I mean, Moses is the real deal. They shouldn't have said anything. And Miriam is struck with leprosy. And uh, the only reason that Aaron and Miriam escape with their lives is because Moses prays for them and God spares them. Now, if you're a recipient of the letter to the Hebrews and you get this letter, you're, you're either a former priest or you're a devoted Israelite. To you, Moses is one of the most important persons in history. It wouldn't be a stretch to say he's the most important person in history because everything you do as an Israelite or a priest to the Lord is done because Moses dictated as spokesperson of God what you're supposed to do in following the Lord. They have the law because of Moses. He's he's the chief of the prophets in the Old Testament. I mean, he is the most important person to you as a recipient of the letter of Hebrews until Jesus. When when Jesus comes... Moses can't hold a candle to Jesus. There's nobody like Jesus. And in Hebrews chapter 3, we get to look into the person of Christ again in a, in, a, in a magnificent fashion. This is just fantastic. And so in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, the passage begins with the word, <clears throat> therefore, since, because, it's a, it's a connecting conjunction. It's just reminding us, that what we're fixing to hear has much to do with what you've already heard. What I just told you is really important for you to keep in mind when you read or listen to what I'm going to say. And so let me remind you what we've heard so that we're ready to read what we're going to hear. All right, and what we heard was that Jesus Christ in chapter 2 became flesh. He became like us so that we might become like him, namely in holiness and in relationship to God the Father. So Jesus Christ took on flesh, becoming like us, so that we might become like him, holiness and relationship to the Father. And through faith in Christ, because Jesus Christ became like us and died for us, and putting our faith in him, because we put our faith in Christ, who is the Son of God, become flesh, then we, as followers of Christ can experience the devil being powerless against us. Because we placed our faith in Christ who became flesh and died for us, we can stare death in the face and actually be fearless towards death. Because Jesus Christ died for us, took our sin upon himself, absorbed the wrath of God for us, then we have been made as if we are sinless. And then in this lifetime, we never again, through faith in Christ, have to find ourselves helpless in the face of all temptations. See, Jesus Christ becoming flesh, coming here and conveying what God's message is, has everything to do with who we are. 
And it's incredibly important that we recognize that God has spoken in Christ, and this is who Christ is in chapters 1 and 2, is unveiling the person of Christ so that we hear the one command in chapters 1 and 2, which is pay attention or listen to Jesus. So I just want to remind you this morning that as we read Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, to listen for Jesus. Listen to who he is and what he said. I'm I'm not just reading words on a page. I'm reading the words of Christ. I'm not just going to talk about grand ideas. I'm talking about what Jesus has said and done and who he is. And I just want to encourage you to pay attention and listen for Jesus. All right, Hebrews chapter 1. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, holy brothers, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider Jesus, or fix your thoughts upon Jesus, the apostle and the high priest of our confession, who being faithful to the one who appointed him as Moses in all his house. For that one, Jesus, is worthy of more glory than Moses, Inasmuch as the one who builds the house is worthy of greater honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of all things. Moses, on one hand, was faithful in God's whole house as a servant for a testimony to that which was to be spoken. But Christ is faithful as a son over his house whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the boast of hope. Now, Hebrews 3.1 starts off with a command. Now, when we read the command in English, it doesn't sound near as stern and, and hard as it is in the original language. It sounds like, consider Jesus. I think you ought to maybe you know, think about Jesus every once in a while. Just consider him. And that's not at all what's happening here this Wording is an intense command for you to focus and fixate your attention upon Jesus Christ, for you to become a student of Jesus, for you to absolutely be engrossed in who he is and study everything about him and seek to know all you can about him and for the remainder of your life to spend all your effort in focusing your full attention and all your thoughts on the person of Jesus Christ. That's the command. It's not an option. This is an Adam and a command for you to diligently place your attention upon Jesus Christ. Now, I've got, I've got a small confession to make to you, and I'm going to make it at the risk of you thinking that I'm weird. I'm hoping some of you can identify with me, but when I get up on Saturday mornings early before the rest of the family, I go into the breakfast table, and I'm there eating breakfast by myself, and usually what I do is I grab a box of cereal and pour me a bowl of cereal and eat a bowl of cereal, and while I'm there... I'm, I find myself looking at the cereal box. Now, if it's just a normal cereal box, it doesn't capture my attention that much. But if it's one of these kind of cereal boxes that have the seek and find on it, all of a sudden breakfast becomes, instead of eating, it becomes about finding what's on the seek and find. And, and is anybody else like that? Okay, I'm weird, and so are four or five of you. But, but what I find myself doing is eating extra bowls of cereal, not because I'm hungry, because I haven't found all the items to be found. You know, there's 13 things on this seek and find you've got to find, and it takes like seven bowls of cereal for me to find 13 <laughs> things on there, and, and, so, and so I just come, become captivated by that. And, and that's the command here in Hebrews 3, We are to sit in front of Jesus and seek to find everything we can about him, becoming captivated by him, enthralled with him, riveted to his very person so that we see Christ in all his glory. We are to set all of our thoughts upon him in all that we do. That's the command here that we're given, and Hebrews gives us great 
starters for setting our thoughts on Jesus. It's like the first two items in the list of the seek and find are the apostle and the high priest, and he just gives us this this easy thing to find that he wants us to see that's supposed to capture our attention so that we cannot, we cannot get away from thinking about Jesus. Jesus is our apostle, the apostle. The word apostle means that it is one who is sent with a message for the one who sent them. So that if I were to ask one of you to uh, go to the nursery with a message, I say, hey, Brendan, will you go to the nursery with a message for me? Here's the message. And if Brendan says, yes, I'll do that, then Brendan has agreed to be my apostle. He is the one being sent with my message. And if he walks into the nursery, he will then deliver the message I've given him with the authority that I've given him to deliver the message. He would be my apostle. And so Jesus is the apostle. He is sent by God to deliver God's message to us as God in the flesh. He is superior to all other messengers before him, all the angels, all the Old Testament prophets. He ranks superior to all of them because God has sent Jesus as God in the flesh to deliver God's message for us, and it's a message which is a heavenly calling. Now notice the address that the author of Hebrews gives to the readers here. He says they are partakers of a heavenly calling. See, Jesus Christ has been sent to us from God as God in the flesh to give a message that's a heavenly calling, a calling to faith, a calling to a great salvation, a calling to his grace. And everyone who places their faith in Jesus Christ becomes a partaker of his calling to salvation. And so Jesus Christ has come with a message from God delivered by his own hand as God in the flesh to us so that we might be captivated by him knowing that it's in him and what he has said we find our life, our peace, our joy, our hope forever. And this one who is the apostle is to capture our hearts. We are to set our attention on him. We are to look intently at him because of who he is and there is no one like Jesus. He's the apostle. And he is the high priest of our confession. Remember in chapter 2, verse 17, that the scripture said that Jesus Christ became like us in all things so that he might become the merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for our sins, for the sins of the people. Jesus Christ took on flesh and became high priest between us and God, a mediator, so that our sins might be paid for and the wrath of God turned away from us. See, Jesus Christ, in being high priest, is able to offer the sacrifice due uh, our sins. He offered himself, received the wrath of God for our sins. He absorbed God's wrath, turned it away from us so that we might stand before God in a different standing because we're in Christ, the high priest. Now, I want you to notice the address, the, the other address that's given to the readers. Holy brothers. How is it that God makes sinners holy? How is it that God makes estranged people enemies of God Brothers, holy brothers. How is that? Because Jesus Christ, his high priest, has stood in our place and taken our our penalty of our sin so that we might be declared holy, so that we might be forgiven. And then he has brought us to God so that we might be in right relationship with God as brothers and sisters of Christ, children of God, where God is our Father. So we are holy brothers. Do you see the progression here of what? is being declared in Jesus being the apostle and the high priest. See, God has sent Jesus to us with a message from God delivered by Jesus as God in the flesh, a message he says, I'm going to bring you back to God. Sin has caused you to be away from me. I'm going to bring you back to God. But the only way that message can be effective is by Jesus Christ becoming the mediator between God and men. 
It's one thing for Jesus to come and declare the message. It's a whole other thing for Jesus to make the message effective. And so Jesus Christ came with the message, and he functions as the high priest, offering himself as the sacrifice, so that the message lands on our ears and becomes effective through the work of Christ. So Jesus Christ, as high priest, is able to bring us back to God. So God sends Jesus to us for God, to speak as God, to bring us back to God. Jesus Christ is the apostle and the high priest, the one who becomes like us so we can become like him in rescuing us back to God. And it only happens through Jesus Christ because of who he is. He is the one who substitutes for us. He is the great savior. He is the living God who has come declaring the message of God that he might rescue us and bring us back to God. There's nobody like him. We need to fix our thoughts on him. We need to become captivated by him because he and he alone is our life, our salvation, our hope, our peace, our eternity, he is everything. And we are nothing without him. We are to set our thoughts completely upon Jesus Christ. Everything he is, all that he said, everything he's done. Is intended to capture us. The author of Hebrews continues to help us out here. Remember, if you're a recipient of the letter to the Hebrews, Moses is the most important person in history to you until Jesus shows up. And the author paints a contrast between Jesus and Moses so that we might understand that Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses by a long shot. In other words, Moses cannot hold a candle to Jesus. And here's why. There are two significant reasons why Moses is inferior to Jesus, why Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses. Number one, Moses is a servant in God's house, whereas Jesus is a son of over God's house. So Moses is a part of God's house. Now granted, Moses is doing a lot in God's house for the building of God's house in the Old Testament, but everything Moses is doing has a direct effect on himself in the sense that he is a part of the house. See, God is the one who's building the house. Only God's the builder of the house, and this is made so that we would attach the building of the house to the person of Jesus who is over the house. There is a distinct difference between Moses, who's in the house, a part of the house, and Jesus, who's over the house, who is the builder of the house. So everything that Moses is doing in the Old Testament is God constructing the house by using a member of the house to bring about some of that construction. Moses is a servant in the house. Jesus is over over the house. You can see the importance of what Moses is doing related to Jesus being over the house in that all that Moses did was for a witness or testimony to that which would be spoken. Notice in in verse 5 that Moses, faithful in God's whole house as a servant, for a testimony to that which would be spoken. Now, that that ought to ring a bell for you. That ought to cause you to think back to Hebrews chapter 1. Flip back to Hebrews chapter 1. And what you ought to read there in verse 2 is, In these last days, God has spoken to us in the Son. So when you think about what's just said in chapter 3, that everything Moses was doing was for a testimony or a witness to what would be spoken It's a direct reference to what we heard already in chapter 1, verse 2, Jesus Christ. So everything that Moses is doing in the house, as God builds his house, is shouting and and painting a banner of one who is to come and speak for God as the Son of God. So everything Moses is doing is pointing to Jesus. Why is Jesus worthy of more glory? Because everything Moses did pointed to Jesus. Think about it. Moses comes in to lead the people out of Egypt. The Bible says of Jesus Christ, my son, who I called out of Egypt. Everything that Moses is doing is pointing right to Jesus. 
Moses was the one supposed to deliver his people out of their slavery, out of their bondage, and lead them in the promised land. What is Jesus Christ doing? He's leading those who believe in him to the promised land of eternity. The promised land of the Old Testament is just a shadow of what's to come. Moses was to construct the tabernacle. This tabernacle made with these, these, all these supplies from the people, that is a shadow of the heavenly realm, the heavenly building that Jesus Christ is responsible for. This is all pointing to what's going to unfold in the rest of Hebrews. Everything that Moses is doing is pointing to Jesus. Moses is supposed to make sacrifices for the people so that their sins are forgiven. What does Jesus Christ do? He becomes the sacrifice once and for all to deal with sins for all time. Everything that Moses is doing is pointing to Jesus, and Jesus is worthy of more glory. He is worthy of all your attention. Now think about that. If you're a recipient of the letter of Hebrews, you spent your whole life studying the words written down by Moses. Your whole life. He didn't hold a candle to Jesus Christ. Jesus is worthy of every bit of your attention. Nobody like him. Now, the second reason why Jesus is so significant and more worthy of more glory is because Jesus, unlike Moses, is not a servant. He is a son over God's house. See, the son is the master builder over the house. And Moses is not fit to even be his apprentice. There's nobody in the same realm as Jesus Christ. He is son over the house, and he is building God's house. He's worthy of our attention. Now, don't miss the fact that the author of Hebrews tells us a little bit about God's house here that is incredibly encouraging. We are God's house. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we have become God's house. Everything coalesces. Everything comes together through the church. See, faith in Jesus Christ makes us a part of the body of Christ, and that means we are the house of God, and that happens because Jesus Christ became flesh, died for us, rose again. Because of Jesus Christ, we become God's house. Now, notice what that means. Everything God's been doing in history has been about building his house. And here we stand at this point in history, and we understand who Jesus is and what he said. We place our faith in Christ, and we have come to the point in history where everything is focused on you and me being built into the house of God, the declaration of the glory of God for his purposes. We are his house, and he's done everything in history building up to the church, to the body of Christ. What that means is that God's attention, that Jesus Christ's effort is directed towards you and me. Jesus Christ is the builder of the house. He he is strengthening, establishing, reinforcing, repairing, servicing, protecting. He's taking care of his house. He is displaying all his strength, his grace, his mercy, his efforts, his purposes toward us as his house. Jesus Christ is doing everything he's doing, fixing his full attention on you and me as we place our faith in him because we are his house. His responsibility and his purpose is to build us into the people that are rescued by him and brought back to God. Jesus Christ, the apostle, sent with God's message, the high priest who makes that message effective to bring us back to God, his house, fully established, rebuilt, made ready for a new heaven and a new earth. Jesus Christ is the builder, and we are his house. If we hold fast, Notice verse 6. We are his house if we hold fast the confidence and the boast of hope. You know, I thought, why is it that a cereal box captures my attention? That's just kind of weird. I mean, think about it. And I realized, you know, it's probably just because there's some little silly challenge on there. It's not like a cereal box in and of itself is worth capturing your attention. I mean, who really wants to admit to that publicly? 
But there's this little challenge on there. See if you can find these 13 things, smarty, you know. And so you're just kind of captured by that. You know, Jesus Christ, in and of himself, is so worthy of our attention. Not even eternity could give us enough time to mine the depths of who Jesus is. And who he is alone is more than enough to capture our hearts. But right here in Hebrews chapter 3, we have this little challenge. But the difference between the box of cereal and this challenge is this is no silly matter. This is a matter of life. It's a really important phrasing here in Hebrews 3.6. In the original language, you can see very clearly there is a strong emphasis on the word we. So that the reader would read this and understand that holding fast is not about me. Holding fast is about we. And the truth is, I cannot hold fast to Christ in this life alone. I need we. We need each other to hold fast. We've got to do this together. We've got to walk together. We've got to share things in life together. We have to work hard to connect our hearts together around the person of Christ. We have to hold fast together like an army. In the Civil War, General Sherman was on his way from the Kennesaw Mountains to the coast and he left a small group of soldiers to protect a fort that had a lot of the rations that they would need later in the battle. As he was gone, a Confederate force came and attacked that small fort and the small force left there and just really ravaged the situation. They, they killed about a third of the people and just as the general was about, who was badly wounded was about to surrender, there was a message that was given by the signal corps, which were located on tops of mountains. They would give signals on the mountaintops, and the, and the signal came across to the fort, and the, and the signal made all the difference in the world. You see, General Sherman was about 15 miles away, and he sent this message by the signal corps to the group that was left in the fort. He said, hold fast. We are coming. When the group got that message, they, they bound together and they said, we're going to hold the fort no matter what. We've heard the message of our commander. We will not give way. And they bound together and they held fast together. We are to hold fast. And we can because we have heard the message of our commander. We have read the testimony of his life and his promises, and we know that he said he's coming back. And the signal has been given across the mountaintops, and we have heard the signal, and we are to hold fast for our commander because he is faithful, he is just, he's the apostle and high priest, and he will bring about our redemption. We hold fast. Specifically, we hold fast to our confidence, and to our boast of hope. This word confidence, we're going to see this again as we work through Hebrews. This word confidence is, is the idea that I can stand before God and I can speak to God and I can be confident that he will hear me and respond to me in grace and mercy. Now, where does that confidence come from? Remember the little address? Holy brothers, holy brothers and sisters, the only way that we can stand for God and be heard as his child is that we've been made brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ through faith in him. And because of Christ and only because of the work of Christ, we can confidently speak before God and know that we'd be heard as Christ is heard. Confidence in Christ alone. The boast of our hope, Jesus Christ is the high priest, the apostle. He is worthy of all glory, all worship. He is the boast of hope. In other words, we can boast in Jesus Christ because he's the one who secured our future. We can boast in him because he's the one who's given us the promise of tomorrow, the promise of eternity. Our hope is in the glory of Christ, so our boast of hope is Jesus and all that he's promised to accomplish as apostle and high priest. 
So we hold fast to Jesus Christ, who is our everything. He's building a house. We are his house. If we hold fast to him. In 2003, the man in Florida started building his dream house. It's 90,000 square feet. I didn't say 9,000. 90,000. I I don't know. Our facilities may be somewhere around 90,000. I mean, that's his house. It's huge. Like 23 full bathrooms. There's one massive kitchen in that kitchen. It's got a 12-seat Japanese steakhouse grill type thing. Then there's 10 other satellite kitchens spread throughout the entire facility. It's like a campus. There's a bowling alley. There's a roller skating rink. There's two movie theaters, one for kids, one for the adults. The ones for the adults has a balcony. There's an 80-foot waterfall. There's a a half-an-acre pool. It's crazy. There's a 20-car underground garage. It is nuts what this guy has done in building his so-called dream house. Well, today, 2012, it stands about 60% complete and is on sale for the bargain price of $65 million dollars. Anybody interested? That house stands as a monument to the deficiency of the owner who cannot finish what he started. God's house is far more significant, far more difficult and costly to build. But Jesus Christ as the builder has more than enough resources to finish what he has started. He is building his house, who we are. He has focused his attention on us so that we might be brought back to God. Jesus Christ will build his house and he will establish it on the new earth. We are his house if we hold fast to him. And if you fix your thoughts on Jesus, guess what will happen? You will hold fast to him. See the connection between the two commands? Fix your thoughts on Jesus. Hold fast to him. Guess what? You fix your thoughts on Jesus, you will hold fast to him every time. You can't help it. It's just what you do when you fix your thoughts on Jesus. You don't fix your thoughts on Jesus, guess what's going to happen? Your confidence, which is supposed to be solely in Christ, is going to move towards being confidence in yourself. Your boast is going to be in what you can do, and that leads to emptiness and condemnation. But if you will fix your thoughts on Jesus Christ, your confidence will be in him, your boast will be in him, and you will be God's house whom he brings to completion for his glory. Hold on to Christ. No one holds a candle to Jesus Christ.